Hello, my name is Peter, and together with my colleague Marek, we are going to tell a few words about the compiler that we open sourced about a half a year ago. Uh, both of us, we work for Avast in Czech Republic. I'm currently the main developer of the compiler, and Marek worked on the preprocessing part of it, and now he's working on ERA infrastructure and developing ERA infrastructure in Avast. So what is REDEC? It is a short for uh, retargetable decompiler. In fact, it is a set of tools. When you put them together, you get the compiler, but they can be used separately. Most of it is implemented as libraries, and uh, we use it internally, some of those in other projects. So for example, file info, which is like a tool for uh, getting information about binary files, is heavily used internally in uh, our malware clustering project. Uh, the core is based on LLVM. Um, I think that there have been several mentions about this uh, in the previous talks, so we will look into it. Uh, we have been developing it for quite a few years, but it's kind of changed a lot. Uh, we started uh, in cooperation with the university, and we still have a cooperation with the university in Brno. And like I said, we open sourced it um, December last year under the MIT license, so everything is on GitHub. What it can do right now, uh, we can decompile uh, for architectures only 32 bits at the moment. Uh, architectures are x86, ARM, PowerPC, and MIPS. Uh, we support the whole bunch of file formats, most of the major ones, or all the major ones. We are working on 64-bit. We actually uh, started cooperation with one student of the university that should work on this in this summer. But I feel like uh, we still have like a lot of quality problems in the output that we need to solve before pushing new features. Uh, as you will see, we do a lot of stuff that you would expect, like uh, compiler detection, static reading code detection, and stuff like that. Uh, it should run, the decompiler should run on all the major systems, operating systems. So what does it do? Like you probably know, you get binary, and what you, what you want to get out of it, of this process, is uh, some kind of s source code. Um, we do just C, the compilation to C. Uh, the decompiler can be split into three logical parts: it's preprocessing, then the core part, and backend that actually generates the C. Uh, now I will let my colleague Marek tell you uh, about preprocessing. Okay, so the uh, first part is preprocessing. It's the first stage of the decompilation. Its main goal is to take the input file and extract as much information as possible from it, and also abstract away all the differences that are uh, in the different executable file formats, because you know, BE, ELF, MACO, they are all different. So uh, for this, we use the file format library. Uh, which takes the input file, uh, parses everything it can, and uh, outputs the binary, universal binary representation. Uh, when we have this binary repre representation, uh, we do compiler and packer detection. Uh, for this detection, we use uh, signatures and heuristics. Uh, signatures are written in a Yara uh, language, so they can be even used outside of our project. Uh, all the parsed information and detected compiler or buffer are then uh, serialized into a JSON file. Uh, when we detect that there is some buffer uh, from the detection phase, uh, we run a set of unpackers. Uh, there, are, there are many unpackers, but there is also one uh, our unpacker. Uh, and the whole process repeats because we don't actually want to decompile the packed file. We want to decompile uh, what's, uh, what, what's actually packed inside of that file. Uh, we, also do, uh, we also have a library for image loading. Uh, it's basically a simulation of the loader of the system because sometimes there are differences between the, how the file looks on the disk and how the file would look like in the memory, especially in ELF, where segments can even overlap, and then you need to decide what's, what bytes are actually at that particular address. Uh, 
Same as we can do this universal binary representation, uh, we can also do that with the uh, debug information. We can parse PDB files or embedded dwarf information and like get the, some universal interface for this. So something about our own unpacker. Uh, well, it's a static unpacker. It uses signatures and heuristics to detect whether it should unpack or not. Currently, it just supports UPX and Empress, but it's, it has a plugin system, so you can develop your own plugins if you want. Uh, the motivation for us to develop something like this uh, was that we have run into many modified uh, UPX variants, so we actually wanted to unpack them, and also uh, uh, many unpackers we used uh, produced files we weren't able to uh, we couldn't able uh, we were able to compile them because for example they dumped the file in the one big section and if you have a code and data in one big section it's really hard for us to decompile it so uh, there's uh, some examples of the UPX modifications uh, we right now support and can deal with uh, here I just did some uh, modification, very easy modification, uh, when you delete just the UPX header and the file becomes not, uh, you cannot unpack it with the uh, UPX, uh, but our unpacker unpacks it, that's, that's, that's our goal. Uh, okay, another thing is uh, Stackoffin, is just the abbrevi abbreviation of static code finder. Uh, Basically, we want to detect where's the static code in the binary. We don't want to decompile it, and also it gives us information what functions does uh, this binary use. Uh, it, we use Flirt-like technology, so uh, hello guys from Hexrace. Uh, but we use uh, Yara uh, again. Uh, so how do we create these uh, patterns that we use to detect uh, statically linked code. We take the library, we ex inspect its symbol table. There are functions uh, it has in, uh, in it, and also there's a size of the function. So we just take that, we take the bytes of the function, uh, we create the Yara pattern from it, then we aggregate these patterns together, and we get the final pattern. Uh, which uh, you can see on the right side. It has some wildcarded bytes, uh, and as you can see, there's always E8 uh, between each uh, highlighted area. So uh, it's actually call. So we are uh, basically uh, wildcarding the calls because uh, we don't want some particular offset to be there. Uh, uh, so how do we match these, these uh, patterns? Well, first we use Yara to find where in the file uh, this, this pattern is actually located. But uh, then you still need to resolve those uh, highlighted areas, those which were uh, uh, wildcarded. But for that, you actually need to start uh, decoding the binary itself. So we use a capstone for that, uh, and now something about uh, file info. It's, uh, as I mentioned, we have this file format library which takes the file and it parses uh, whatever it can. Uh, this, this tool, file info, is just, uh, is just some wrapper around the, around the file format, so we can run the file format and see what it actually parses. Uh, it supports P, ELF, MACO, COF, Intel Hex. It can output uh, either plain text that is human readable information or JSON output which we use for automated processing. Uh, here is a list of some features of the file info I uh, just uh, put there, but there's much more it can do and we are constantly uh, trying to add new features. You can use this tool in your tool chain if you want. We would be more than happy. Uh, and now a little bit of demo how this file info works. So I take the file info and I run it on some binary. 
And this is basically the plain output that is supposed to be human readable. It prints you uh, the information it uh, parsed from the binary. And here are our detected compilers. Uh, it detected that probably it was C++ and uh, there's a reach header or uh, overlay offset and size. But that's not all. If I add uh, dash V, I get a lot more information. And uh, for example, there's a path to PDB. So it was probably some Thunderbird, as you can see. Uh, there is a reach header data directories of the PE file. There is a section table with hashes. So there's a sections import table together with the import hash. Uh, here are imports. Uh, reallocations, no reallocations, resources. There's a manifest, certificates from the security directory. Uh, there are loader information from the loader I mentioned before. And uh, also I mentioned that we are able, uh, I haven't mentioned it, but it was on the slide, uh, that we are able to uh, reconstruct .NET types. So I have some .NET file, and here you can see there is some like C-sharp like uh, output that uh, prints information about the uh, .NET information, and if you look up, you can see that file info also told us that it was probably .NET file. Uh, also, I mentioned JSON, so if I add J, then you can get this JSON and you can process it in your tool chain if you want. So that would be it. Here are just some screens. Uh, and I would like to hand it back to Peter. So now to the core part. Core part. Uh, the core takes an image that Marek told about, and its goal is to lift it up to LLVM IR, which is LLVM intermediate representation. It also takes some other stuff like JSON metadata from file info. If there is debug, then debug information and some databases like uh, ABI specification, function signatures, and stuff like that. Uh, so what is LLVM? It is basically a set of tools, set of libraries that are meant for uh, com to, that are meant for compiler development. Uh, probably the most important program that uses this is Clang or Clang. It is a compiler. Uh, it takes C, and Clang is basically a front end that parses the C or C++ into AST. And then at some point it uh, generates LLVM intermediate representation and then the LLVM comes in. There is a bunch of passes. Each pass works like that, that it takes this intermediate representation, does some specific job, modifies it, outputs it, and passes it to the next pass. And then in the end, there is backend that generates the machine code. So what we do is reverse. We start on the, uh, the other side and go in the reverse. Uh, so for example, if you take Clang and you compile a Hello C and you force Clang to uh, print all the passes that it uses, and there might be like 200 passes. Uh, there are some of them here. Uh, if you do the same with uh, the decompiler, then we, we basically uh, also have a bunch of passes. I'm, I don't know how many. Uh, it is a mixture of our own passes, and we can use some general LLVM passes to optimize the code. So if you look in our uh, like chain, we start with some initialization, then there is decoder, and then there is a bunch of passes that are meant to like lift the level of abstraction. And then some, sometimes, somewhere to the end, there are these uh, like meta passes LLVM, there are dozens of LLVM passes that we use. Okay, uh, the intermediate representation. Uh, like, you said, uh, like I said, we use LLVM IR, uh, it is kind of an assembly language. Mm. There are roughly around six, uh, 60 instructions. We don't really use all of those. Some are really specific and some are like uh, vector instruction and stuff like that. Uh, already several times was mentioned SSA, static signal assignment, and it is also a load store architecture. There are functions. There are ar uh, functions can have arguments. There are returns and data types. Uh, regarding control flow, there are conditional and unconditional branches and switches. There are no for or loops or whiles and stuff like that. And 
uh, it is a decent enough representation for us. So there is an example that uh, I will demonstrate a few things. In this example, a global variable is defined. This is this. And there is a function. Function have a return type and one argument. And the body of the function loads a global variable to variable named x. Then it adds this x with uh, argument. And the result is stored to y. And then it is stored back to global variable and returned. Now, what that SSA means is that these variables, x and y, are like tem temporary variables or helpful variables, and they cannot be redefined. So there is only one place of definition for those. SSA doesn't apply to anything that is allocated. So for example, this global, or there are no, no such uh, variables here, but there could be like locally allocated variables on function stack. So these are operated with load and stores, and you can store as many times as you want. Uh, this is going to be important in, when I will be talking about pattern matching. So how do we actually get from binary data to LLVM IR? Uh, there are two main components. One is a decoder pass. This is basically this assembler, but we call it decoder. And the second one is a library that can translate uh, binary data to LLVM IR, and it is using Capstone. So, uh, at, the, at the start, there is like anti LLV module. Uh, that decoder pass is like a logic that guides and says what should be decoded. And it is giving a position and data to that translation library. The translation library takes the data, uh, puts them to Capstone, Capstone returns instruction. And then there is like a lookup table that says if this is the Capstone instruction, generate this template and fill it up. Uh, with concrete values, and it gets control back to the pass, the coder pass that uh, do some more logic. So, uh, the very important thing about this library is that uh, you want it to be kind of dumb, that it doesn't modify anything outside of the context of, of the scope of the currently translated instruction. So, we don't want it to do any assumptions about control flow or stuff like that. The only thing it does is it takes capstone instruction and generates some template of LLVM IR sequence. Uh, I will show this on an example. Like I said, currently we have four um, architectures. They were hand coded. I did some research and uh, if we could use something that would like generate semantic automatically, but uh, in the end I decided to write it on our own. Um, Three of these are already supported in 64-bit, but the, the compiler itself doesn't at the moment. Uh, ARM is only 32-bit. It is because of Capstone has two modules for ARM and ARM64, so uh, we don't have 64-bit ARM. There are many more architectures in Capstone that we can support, but not at the moment. Um, there is uh, full semantics only for the most important, the most core instruction, not for all of them. Uh, it would be very hard to write this for everything, and it would be counterproductive for us. We don't really need full semantics for instruction like this. It would be really huge, and in the output C, it would be a huge sequence of crazy operations that no one would understand in any way. Um, in fact, there was al already mention of the talk uh, about hex race uh, intermediate representation, and uh, they also said something like they even dropped rotations Right now we, we do have rotations, but even operation like that may be too complicated and you don't really get uh, much uh, to have full semantics for this. So, um, like I said, this is a library. Uh, one of the users of the library is Redeg itself, but there is also this uh, tool called Redeg Capstone to LVM IR uh, that I will use to demonstrate uh, this. Uh, this you, this tool takes uh, assembly uh, instruction and it translates it to LVM IR, so we can see uh, like what it outputs. It usually, I said it, uh, this is MIPS, 32-bit, and translate, this is integer addition. It adds 1,000 to value to register uh, V0 and put it to 80. Uh, it would produce something like this. This is like uh, registered, registers are represented as, glo as global variables. We've got one function. Um, all instructions in LLVM must be associated with function. So we, don't, we can't have any like, free-floating instructions. 
and this is the sequence that uh, corresponds to the assembly instruction. I chose MIPS because if I did this with x86, there would be like 20 more lines computing flex, but here we can see pretty easily that uh, we just load value from V0 at 1000 and store it to 80. Uh, when I was talking about that context, we want this library, that do tra the translation, to just dump this and do not modify anything else in the module. This is important in this uh, second example. I'm translating x86, uh, jump equal 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah, whatever. Um, and, cap, uh, and LLVM IR has a branchy instruction, but the translator won't actually generate it. Instead, it will generate this pseudo call. We've got four pseudo calls, call, return branch, and conditional branch. Why didn't we generate a branch here instead of this? Uh, because we cannot really do branch uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, if in LLVM, you have to branch on some labels, which is like a basic block. But if you are doing that, then you need to create basic block, and the basic block can be somewhere else. It can be in different function. Maybe it already exists. Maybe you need to create it. Uh, we don't know. And this whole logic is pretty complicated, and we don't want uh, the translator library to deal with this. So it just generates these pseudo, pseudo calls. Uh, the module that really deals with this is the decoder. So this is the part that guides it and do these logical assumptions. Uh, it, like I said, it's basically a disassembler. Um, it is uh, recursive travel, so decoding, disassembling. Um, we've got uh, this priority queue. At first, we fill it up with all the targets that we think that there might be code here. We take the most, uh, the first one with the highest priority and start decoding. Uh, from that point, it is like linear decoding until you hit uh, something that changes control flow. You try to resolve that and continue. Um, we would start with this module. It is empty. It is like empty environment. All the registers, of course, there are two, only two here, but there will be many more. One function that is empty, this function is right now isn't associated with any address, but it would get filled, so uh, instruction would get filled here, and those pseudo calls, declaration of those calls. So let's say that we are decoding a binary that has entry point or 880, 980 hexa here. We would say, okay, decode this, and that code would, would be here where there are three dots. I, I don't have it here because it would be too long. Uh, add instruction doesn't modify control flow, so it's okay. We would continue to the next one and the next one. So here, the three dots would be the code that gets uh, translated from these instructions until we hit uh, 1,000 hexa. And here, there is an instruction that modifies control flow. Uh, in the first point, uh, the decoder says to the translator library, please translate this it will translate it to, the, to this, what is on the left side, and it will also like, notify the decoder that, hey, I just translated something that is modifying control flow. Uh, now the decoder does that, all the logic that I was talking about. It will determine uh, what's the target. In this case, it is easy because it is integer, but it could be jumping on register or something, so it would try to dynamically uh, like determine the value, uh, like target value. And then when it knows the value, it does all that logic. In this case, um, there is no label, so it creates a label. And when, when it has the labels, it can throw away the pseudo branch and uh, replace it with a real branch. Uh, there are more situations, more complicated. So for example, there already may have been this label, so then it doesn't get created, it gets used. Uh, the label might be in different functions, so we need maybe split functions. Maybe it is even like in the middle of the instruction, that means that something went wrong. wrong. Okay, after this happens, what we get is basically LLVM IR module with uh, all the instructions that we are gonna get. There are functions and there is a complete control flow. Um, now we are lifting it up to a better, higher uh, abstraction. There is a lot of passes that does this, but it would be too long and uh, to go through all of them. One thing that they all have in common is they are doing some kind of pattern matching. And this is when the SSA and uh, Loadstore comes into play. 
Uh, LLVM itself has a really great pattern matching that is using the fact that it is SSA. If you are interested in uh, C++ and templates, then I'm really uh, recommending looking at this header. It is a very uh, nice implementation of uh, mechanism for um, general tree-based pattern matching. What it cannot do is get through those loads and stores. So if, it is, if you are matching some, some pattern and there are some loads and stores, this thing cannot go through load because you, you, do, you do, for example, load EAX, but it doesn't know where, uh, where the, all the stores that can like, write to EAX before. You need something stronger for this. This is when uh, our own layer comes. Uh, we've got, of course, um, reaching definition analysis, also known as use def, the views chains. Uh, on top of this, there is like a symbolic tree. This is like an array tree that like expands all the possible uh, values that uh, like come to play when you are tracking a uh, value of some variable. And then LLVM lag matcher on, on top of this. So for example, what can happen is that there is this pattern in the LLVM IR that was uh, created, and we would like to simplify, match it and si simplify it. Um, we would do so, um, it gets simplified to this one, so basically what happens here is, is, it, is it is just uh, comparing two values and finding out if, it, if they are not equal. How we match it? We've got uh, this matcher, that's the main function. Uh, this is the object that we are matching, in this case the tree. And then there are these matchers. Uh, we want to match uh, integer comparison that has two operands. The first one is, again, integer comparison, and the second one is one. And that inner comparison has also two operands. One is sub and one is zero. Uh, these leaves get binded to these values. So in the, if this is matched, then here in the body of the if, I can use these values val1 and val2. Uh, this C means that it is like commutative, so it can be in uh, whatever order. So this is pretty strong, and there are really like hundreds of patterns like this. Uh, we use them to detect uh, idioms, optimize the instructions. We need to do some x86 FP analysis, conditional branch uh, transformation. That would be actually like this example to simplify conditional branches. Um, reconstruct stack and, and so on and so on. So uh, then when uh, all these passes are successfully completed, uh, we no longer can lift uh, LLVM IR higher in this stage, so the backend comes in. It actually transforms the LLVM IR to like the output language, uh, C in this case. Uh, it is using another representation, it is called beer, um, but it is basically an abstract syntax tree. Um, as it is converting the LVM IR to this AST, it is, going, it is doing code structuring. So it is transforming all those branches, conditional and unconditional branches, to like higher level uh, control flow structures, like uh, if then LCs, loops, fours, and so on. So it is again basically just identifying patterns and transforming it, uh, lifting it up. It is also doing some more optimizations, unsurprisingly. Uh, some arithmetic, maybe negation, blah, blah, whatever. Maybe what is interesting is even it translated branches to, for example, files, but even then it can determine that this is not good enough. So, for example, it could create something like while true, and then in the body it would be like if condition break. So it needs to, again, translate this one more time to something better to basically move the condition to while, not to do if a condition break. Uh, and then it can generate the code. Um, we are doing some context-based uh, naming when it is possible, and also there is some context-based uh, transformation or substitution of uh, literal constants uh, to uh, some defines, like in this case, we know that number seven in the context of this function can be expressed as uh, this expression, which is much nicer than seven. Uh, then we generate C or control flow or call graph and so on. Uh, like I said, um, no, I didn't, but it is basically just uh, the whole thing uh, 
like a set of libraries and some pretty easy and simple programs that are just like front faces for it and everything is like common common line so um, it's, it, I would say this is basically just our research uh, and we use parts of it in like automated systems so we never really wanted to make this like GUI on or anything but uh, if you want to uh, we did some like proof of concept uh, and we created uh, IDA plugin uh, so you can use it kind of like hex race. Of course, it is not as good uh, at the moment, at least. <laughs> uh, but it it just shows that it can be done. Uh, how how do we do that? We let IDA to uh, process the binary, and then the, if the plugin is triggered, it just takes all the information that IDA has and serializes it into JSON. Uh, we do this because IDA is basically mm, like more accurate than us. That's uh, one thing. And the second thing is we want to have the same names and stuff that IDA has. So for example, we want name functions differently or global variables or stuff like that. So then when you trigger the compilation with this JSON, all this information gets used and uh, the resulting C should have the same names and uh, base, uh, look like uh, the stuff that you see in IDA. And then the C is displayed to you. Uh, until recently, this was only uh, like six yeah, built on uh, IDA SDK, SDK 6.6, .6, but prior to this conference, I rewrote it uh, using IDA SDK 7.0, so it should work on 7.x. Um, as I was rewriting it, I discovered that several problems, but at the moment, I didn't fix them, so it is just a pure rewrite. Uh, but we will get to it and make it better. It doesn't work in uh, IDA freeware. Now, this is like an example. It tries to be interactive, but like it is here that we have to fake it, kind of. We are not really sitting in IDA. That plugin is really like lightweight uh, face that is triggering this whole uh, command line, the compilation uh, all over every time you do something. Um, so, but we try to fake it. I don't know how successful we are, but uh, you can try it. Uh, it looks basically like uh, if you had a hex race uh, in your window. If everything goes okay, then the quality is comparable. Sometimes, or um, like I said, we are currently we cannot compete uh, with the, um, the quality like all the time. But uh, like you see here, if it's uh, it often works and it can give you some information that you wouldn't have if you didn't use any kind of the compilation. So what's next? Even though we made some, uh, I would say, major improvements in the last version, I still am not satisfied with uh, uh, the code quality and that this translates to output quality because it is really hard to improve if the code isn't uh, like in order. Uh, also, we went now through several tools that we use, uh, but we don't really have them documented, and I think that there, there are many more tools that uh, we don't have time to go through, but I think that there might be people that would be interested in this, uh, maybe not the whole the compilation, but maybe some parts of it, and they wouldn't even know that we have something like that, and how can they, they use them, so better documentation is probably in order. Of course, then, 64-bit uh, architectures, uh, improving the IDA plugin and writing plugins for other major tools like these three. Uh, there probably are already some tools for Binary Ninja and maybe even Radar, but uh, I didn't look into them. I don't know how good they are, how, how good they work. We will probably contact the authors and uh, ask if we can make some improvements to, uh, to give them some support so that uh, these this plugins are really usable. Uh, okay, that's all. I don't know how, how much time do I have. Oh, it's not so bad. Mm. Yeah, uh, so for example, here is Ida. I will close this. Uh, F5, so this is hex race. And now hopefully there is some switch. Yeah. Not so complicated, but also uh, not totally trivial. And this should be, yeah, 
This is the output of our decompiler. It is more verbose than uh, X-rays, but basically it does the same thing. And like I said, if it goes okay, then uh, the quality is fine. And you can, you can get some information from this. Okay. No, I don't. Okay, that, that's all for me. If you have any questions, we will. So you mentioned that you do some uh, jump branch analysis um, when you are uh, computing with branches. How do you deal with uh, impossible branch situations? Like if you have two immediates or if there's like an XOR test in uh, x86 um, to make sure that uh, like if a branch is never going to be taken, do you follow it first or? Um, can you repeat that? I <laughs> Yeah, so if you come up to a potential branching situation where there's no outcome that will result in the branch being taken, like some type of control flow obfuscation this way? Yeah, uh, if you cannot resolve it, we just leave there the, some kind of uh, those pseudo calls. So it would say something like, there is a branch with this value, but we don't know where it is going. Uh, so we just don't translate it uh, into a real... Uh, branching, the, uh, the pseudo calls are left there in the code. It also can happen that sometimes uh, we can actually um, determine the target, but still won't translate it into calls. This is uh, typical, for example, for ARM, where one function can just branch into other function, like middle of other function, but we really cannot uh, translate this into uh, LVM because it won't let you do that you would have to split the function. So in this case, again, there is some pseudo call. Uh, so instead of branch, there will be like call of a function that is probably named something like jump out or st stuff like that. Thank you. Hey, you mentioned um, Capstone supports a bunch of other architectures. I was just curious, like what's involved in adding support for decompiling another architecture it supports? Yeah. Uh, you basically just need to write one module into that translation library, and it sh that should be all. Uh, you just uh, um, basically look how the other modules are implemented, and then all those modules look like there is one big map, map that says if this is this capstone instruction, then this uh, routine gets triggered, and in that routine there is like a sequence of LLVM IR uh, instructions that that is like the template that get generated. And those that don't have this uh, gets translated into those pseudo assembly uh, calls. So basically, uh, you should, or you have to write just one module in the translator. Perfect. Thanks. But I have to say, uh, this is, this is uh, that's theoretical. <laughs> uh, like I said, the translator already can translate, for example, 64-bit x86, but the compiler doesn't support it. Why not? There is actually a branch uh, that is not master where this is enabled. So you can actually decompile uh, x, uh, 64 uh, binary. But why don't we support it yet? Because the quality isn't good. Uh, there are some differences. For example, x86, x64 uses different uh, calling conventions, and our analysis doesn't support those, so each call gets uh, really screwed. So you get some output, but it is not good enough. Okay, then uh, let's thank the speaker again.